You are listening to the International Radio Report. Your reactions are much appreciated. Feel free to send them to radio report at yahoo.com. That is radio report at yahoo.com. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the International Radio Report for Sunday, February the 18th. My name is Sheldon, here with Jill as usual. We thank you for tuning into our show. We're here every Sunday morning at 1030 Eastern uh, time in Montreal with 30 minutes of news and information from the world of radio. You can reach us by email, radioreport at yahoo.com. Our show is live streaming and archived at ckut.ca. Our Facebook group uh, with 957 members, uh, look for International Radio Report and join the group on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel where you can uh, catch the show at your convenience. Also go back and listen to previous shows. Uh, Look for at IRR on YouTube or just search for International Radio Report and you can subscribe there as well. We have 944 subscribers. Our Twitter account at IRRCKUT. So lots of interesting stuff going on this week. Uh, We're going to start off with a follow-up to a really interesting story that we had for you last week, but it's sort of sparked some controversy. Yeah, we actually had our own doubts here on the show, and uh, it's apparently skeptics question disappearance of Alabama Radio Tower. This is by Randy J. Stein of Radio World. Did the general manager of WJLX fake the theft of the station's own 200-foot AM radio tower? Some online skeptics think so. Brett Elmore says it just isn't so. The alleged theft of that tower in Jasper, Alabama, which we told you about earlier, gained attention from national and international media outlets, uh, USA Today, The Guardian, uh, South China Morning Post, and many others. But it has also generated a lot of snarky comments from some observers, including several radio engineers, who doubt the plausibility of the story. General Manager Brett Elmore says... Thieves stole the tower from its rural transmission site. He reported the incident to police on February 2nd. He said the theft of the tower and other equipment, including its transmitter, took the station off the air. Elmer says he was unaware that structure had gone missing until a land clearing company made the discovery and called him. The station had no remote monitoring equipment, so personnel were unaware the AM station was off the air prior to the discovery. However, questions about how a 200-foot tower could vanish without a trace, as Elmore described it, swirled baffling is the word one engineering expert used in a post discussing the case, especially in a span of 24 hours. Some commenters speculated that WJLX had failed to maintain its AM site over time, but needed to keep its related FM translator on the air and required a cover story. One unattributed comment in a Facebook group insisted that the AM has been off the air for several years and the site neglected, but that rumors of an FCC complaint about the silent AM led him to believe there might soon be an inspection revealing the tower's sad state and inability to operate. Also, a YouTuber, William Collier, said he visited the WJLX tower site and filmed his experience to document it. His discoveries, according to the video, included rusted guy wires, dilapidated fencing, unmowed grass, and a transmitter building that had seemingly fallen into disrepair. In the video, he challenges the owner's assertions that the tower was stolen. Instead, he hypothesizes that the radio station operators let the property fall into disrepair and that the AM station was perhaps off the air for an extended time prior to the tower suddenly going missing. Radio World contacted Brett Elmore to follow up. People are going to speculate and they think it is an inside job, but I can assure you I had nothing to do with it, he said. We didn't disassemble a 200-foot tower or steal the equipment, Elmer says. 
He has given police access to records from the utility company that provides service to the tower site that shows electrical usage until the alleged theft that proved the station had been in operation prior to the tower disappearing. If the FCC were to ask for proof the station has been operating, Elmer says he would offer them the power bills, though he declined to share those records with Radio World. When asked why no listeners reported the station being off the air, he said an elderly woman who listens to the AM radio station uh, for its church programming typically would have called him if the station was off the air, as she had done in the past. I really can tell you why we didn't have a call. The station didn't have a silence sensor or remote monitoring equipment because of the expense of the equipment. Elmore says he is unsure how transmitter readings for the AM station were taken prior to the incident. Elmore has organized a GoFundMe page to raise funds to rebuild the tower and purchase a new transmitter. So far, the GoFundMe effort has raised around $10,000. It has a goal of $60,000. Elmer says he is hopeful he can get the AM station back on in band aid mode within a week or two. So lots of interesting, intriguing news in here. The YouTuber that took some uh, videos, the uh, people that are very skeptical. Indeed, also, as we did last week, how can 200-foot tower disappear without nobody seeing anything? I mean, it can't vanish like that. It's not, not a 200-foot tower. No, and if you see some of the pictures, we're, we're going to put a link to the story, and you'll see some photographs in the, in the article showing you the state of the transmitter building and the whole site. I mean, it's a very old uh, station. You know, the story that they didn't have any remote monitoring equipment, I, I just can't see a station going off the air and nobody saying anything about it. Mm. Like they're, I mean, they're saying it was a, a company that showed up and saw that the thing was down. Well, you have a radio station. You hope somebody's listening, and if you're yeah. not on the air, that somebody's going to say something. So, you know, we we had those doubts last week when we talked about this story, and now some of it is coming to light. If the station, it does have an FM relay, uh, so that was working. So um, I don't know. You know, it sounds to me that given the state of the equipment that even if they were trying to repair stuff, it would have cost them a lot of money. So maybe let's just, you know, get rid of it somehow. And, you know, some scrap metal dealer or something takes it away or, or what have you. And uh, let's see if we can raise some money to put it back. Now they talk about the station, some people speculating it'd been off the air for a long time. The FCC does have notices of that, that uh, if a station has a license, it has to be on the air. Yeah. And they give them a bit of leeway. But if it was off for an extended period of time, then they would receive notice and they could potentially lose their license. So a lot of different factors involved. So uh, will we ever get to the bottom of it? <laughs> you know, somewhere in the in the woods of Jasper, Alabama, is there a 200-foot tower lying on its side somewhere? Mm -hmm. uh, who knows? Yeah, it's a great story to get money to put up a new tower. That's for sure. <laughs> was it was it insured? We don't know if the site was insured as well. You yeah. know, was it insured for theft? I don't know if you'd <laughs> insure a tower of two hundred feet high for theft. Like you don't yeah. expect somebody to rob it, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Just uh, it certainly made for an interesting story, as it said that you know it was covered literally all over the world, and uh, I guess a lot of people were asking the same question: like, how do you get away yeah. with a two hundred foot tower? Our next story is a sad one to report. Uh, it comes from Radio Inc. Bob Edwards, the 25-year voice of NPR or National Public Radio's Morning Edition, has died at 76 years old. Bob Edwards, the foundational voice of NPR, passed away at the age of 76 uh, last weekend. For more than two decades, his voice greeted millions of Americans each day as the host of Morning Edition. Edwards started his radio career at WHEL in New Albany, Indiana, before serving in Korea with the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. After Korea, he moved to WTOP in Washington, D.C., 
which led to his hiring at NPR in 1974, where he became the co-host of All Things Considered. That's a really popular show on the stations alongside Susan Stamberg. In 1979, he took on what was initially a 30-day role as the host of the recently launched Morning Edition. Throughout his career on Morning Edition, Edwards was recognized for his contributions to broadcasting with numerous accolades, including two Gabriel Awards, the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award in 1995, and a Peabody Award in 1999. In 2004, NPR replaced Edwards as host of the Morning Edition, after which he transitioned to then XM Satellite Radio uh, to launch the Bob Edwards Show. His contributions to radio were honored with an induction into the Radio Hall of Fame in 2004. WBUR CEO and former NPR uh, Senior Vice President of News, Margaret Lowe, said, quote, he was a total news guy, and I think he understood the news deeply. And in some ways, he sort of set the bar for how we approach stories, because he would convey these stories with a kind of simplicity, but also with real depth, and make sure that they somehow resonated. And that's lasted. NPR President and CEO John Lansing commented, as an NPR listener myself, I will always remember Bob Edwards' deep, warm baritone and the confident ease of his delivery. Bob Edwards understood the intimate and distinctly personal connection with audiences that distinguishes audio journalism from other mediums. And for decades, he was a trusted voice in the daily lives of millions of NPR listeners. So another pioneer radio voice uh, silenced and uh, yep. certainly many, many, many listeners, I'm sure, uh, were tuned in regularly to uh, to Bob Edwards on Morning Edition on NPR. So we have some pirate news to update our listeners on. Yeah, FC, FCC plans pirate fine against Super Danny by Paul McLean, Radio World. So the Federal Communications Commission plans to fine a man $40,000 for alleged pirate radio broadcasts in the eastern Pennsylvania city of Hazelton. It has issued a notice of apparent liability against Brigido Danaris Gonzalez for radio signals on 90.1 MHz. It said it first became aware of the station known as La Bacana thanks to a consumer complaint and that Gonzalez, a.k.a. Super Danny, has been directly involved in the operation of the station since at least May of 2022. The commission first traced the signals to the address of a grocery store. Agents spoke with the owner of a supermarket located at the first transmission site who stated that he paid an individual who went by the name Super Danny approximately $50 per month to advertise on La Bacana, according to the FCC summary. Based on information provided by the owner of the supermarket, agents contacted the owner of the building at the first transmission site, who stated that she was not aware of any pirate radio station transmitting from her building, but described Super Danny as a famous radio personality in Azelton. On subsequent visits to the area, the FCC agents traced the 90.1 broadcasts to two other transmission sites. The commission said the agents also found references to La Bacana online and that in a YouTube video of an interview with Super Danny, he stated that his name is Danaris Gonzalez. Radio World emailed Gonzalez and will report any comment. People facing a pirate radio notice have 30 days to reply to the FCC to explain why they should not be required to pay the fine. Interesting story. Interesting to see that seems to have moved around with his 90.1 megahertz uh, transmitter. And, uh, well, a well-known personality, radio personality in Hazleton, apparently. 
<laughs> yeah, some you'd think somebody would be asking, uh, yeah, what what station would that be again? You know? <laughs> but uh, who knows? You know, how many people know anything about pirate radio? Yeah. They hear something on the radio, yeah. they just assume it's a radio station. But this guy was pretty bold. He was selling advertising <laughs> on his station to the local grocery store. So uh, yeah, pretty uh, pretty bold for sure, and moving it around so as not to be uh, not to be traced, I guess. But now he's going to have to answer for his uh, for his doings on ninety point one. So uh, we'll see what comes of that. So what is happening with our son? Well, our son is pretty active. It has flared quite a few times this week. Uh, there's been also a lot of uh, polar cap absorption events this week. Uh, so if you had uh, some uh, problems getting stations like you know KBS World Radio, Radio Thailand. That could be the case. Uh, it's subsiding, so it might actually get uh, better. But uh, the sunspot is complex. AR3576 can flare again, and there's uh, quite a few uh, sunspots that also are uh, good for some uh, solar flares this week. So conditions will be uh, up and down probably due to all of this. The sunspot number, 151. The solar flux, 178. And, uh, well, look for possible auroras, look for possible changing conditions on the radio. And the only way that you can actually witness this is to have an actual radio that you'll turn on to listen. This is Janice of Dorval. The International Radio Report presents 30 minutes of news, information, and commentary on developments in the world of radio every Sunday morning at 1030 on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal and online at ckut.ca. Our next story is in the continuing saga of AM radio in cars, or not, <laughs> whichever way you want to look at it. This time, um, an interesting source coming forward in support of it. It is UNESCO. Uh, they have called on automakers to keep radio in cars. Uh, this story comes from Nick Langan of Radio World. As part of this year's World Radio Day celebrations, which marked 100 years of radio, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, called upon the technology and automotive industries to ensure that radio remains available in cars. The statement comes as AM radio advocates continue the fight on Capitol Hill to keep the senior band as a mainstay in electric vehicles and new models, some of which have already dropped the service. In a joint statement issued on February the 13th, UNESCO and a notable contingent of worldwide broadcast organizations, including AMARC International, the European Broadcasting Union, the Public Media Alliance, and the World Radio Alliance, urge the design of future automobile models to include broadcast radio. Radio has its place in the digital transformation of the information ecosystem, complementing the internet and digital platforms, the statement read. The evolution of communications technologies should advance people's rights to receive information and ideas through any media instead of regressing it. UNESCO lauded radio for providing itself as a crucial medium in times of crisis, including when broadband service is unavailable or power is disrupted. Radio is also highlighted for demonstrating the trust it has with citizens throughout repeated studies ranked above television, the internet, or social media. Radio is a triumph of accessibility, immediacy, and intimacy, and there's a strong public interest case for protecting it and our access to it, UNESCO said. UNESCO said it believes that the exclusion of radio from vehicles would limit people's access to information solely to online platforms. Regardless of how radio broadcasts are received via analog or digital means or delivered through terrestrial over-the-air signal or internet stream, the statement underscores that radio in cars should not just be easy to find, it must be impossible to miss. The joint statement concludes by calling upon governments, regulatory bodies, the technology and automotive industries, and all members of the global radio community to put safeguards in place to ensure that radio continues to thrive, to protect the free and unfettered access radio provides to a plurality of opinions and to trusted information. 
So that is a pretty strong statement in support of not just AM radio, which has been the main topic that's being talked about, particularly with the electric cars, but radio in general, which leads you to believe that some manufacturers are now looking at the possibility of taking radio out completely. Definitely, some manufacturers might be either tempted to remove them because, oh, we'll save a few bucks here. But unfortunately, I think it's important that every, every vehicle has a radio. If you go buy a car, it shouldn't even be in, in, in a question you have to ask, do I have a radio in my car? It, it should yeah, just it be looks, there. It looks like you might have to start asking that. At, yeah. uh, you know, uh, it's it's interesting because we haven't really heard about that. No. Uh, we've heard about the AM radios in particular, but this is going you know a step further. So um, you know, there's obviously for all of these organizations to step forward and say, hey, you know, uh, keep radio in the car. Obviously, they've got some information that some of the manufacturers are looking at going that route of taking the radio out altogether. And you know, so, they might be uh, thinking um, also, well, if they are starting to to find excuses for AM radio, why, you know, by extension, um, maybe they're going to go even further and, hey, no radio. Yeah, I mean, if you've seen some of the new cars, they got these giant screens on the dash and they've got all kinds of, you know, hookups for music services and and you name it. I mean, you can you can do almost anything you want in the car on on these things, which is extremely distracting to begin with uh for safety reasons, but uh, you know, radio is turn it on and let it play and and that's that's the way it works, but this this is something different. This will be interesting to follow. See what sort of reaction uh, the uh, auto manufacturers and the tech technological world has to this statement. Yeah. Um, nice to see that uh, that UNESCO stepped forward and did this. Yep, definitely. So we have a tentative upcoming broadcast. It happened every year. We think it's going to happen this year again, and it's a special yearly broadcast from Radio. Home run. Um, this is supposed to be on the 21st of February, this coming Wednesday. Uh, the annual shortwave broadcast of Radio Amrung or Radio Umrung from Amrung Island, German North Frisian Islands. The tentative schedule it should be, in, like in the past years, that was a frequency in time 16 to 1659 UTC on 15215 kilohertz and uh, this was uh, via Isudun France transmitter site in the past years it's a mix of German Frisian dialect and English and uh, there's QSLs that can be um, asked for via the transmitter operator media broadcast uh, qsl-shortwave at media-broadcast.com We'll be posting the email also in the, in the uh, comments and, and on the Facebook page. Hopefully, he's going to be there. It's been there for many years. We haven't heard. You know, I, I looked online. We kind of know each year when it's going to be there, only a day or two before it happens. So um, there's no reason to believe they won't. But if they aren't, it's a possibility. Don't blame us <laughs> if it's not there. Uh, we're just, uh, you know, we, we're we're hopeful that it will be it is kind of a very unique broadcast yes um i didn't know where these north frisian islands were you had to look them up it, it is part of germany mm. but it's almost like they don't really want to be part of they want to be their own little little area yeah. and uh this dialect of uh, frisian that they use is uh it sounds like german to me but it is a dialect yeah. So uh, kind of an interesting broadcast to tune in. So uh, we'll post up the information about it. Check it out. It may be there. It may not be. Uh, we do hope that it is, though. I, I like these little annual uh, unique events that take place on shortwave. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So um, we've got upcoming ham radio contests. We do. Um, we'll get through those. And then we have a couple little uh, highlights that are going on on the ham bands for you uh, uh, that you might find interesting to try to hear or contact if you are a ham operator. First off, though, we have a big contest coming up for people who are interested in the 160 meter band. It's CQ's 160 meter band contest in SSB, in sideband. 2200 Zulu, February 23rd, 
to 2200 Zulu, February the 25th, so two days, organized by CQ Magazine on a 160 meter band, both CW and SSB, it says, but it does say it's a SSB contest, so I'm not sure. It's a little confusing there, yeah. uh, whether it's both or just SSB. Um, anyways, check it out. 160 meters is always a fun band to try. It can be quite difficult and noisy at times, so uh, a good way to challenge out your equipment and your antennas. So we have Le Réseau des Émetteurs Français that does La Coupe de RF Contest, SSB, 0600 Zulu, February 24th to 1800 Zulu, February 25th. Objective is French amateurs work as many amateur stations and as many French uh, of the 97 metropolitan departments, overseas territories, and DXCC countries of the world as possible. Foreign amateurs work as many France stations in as many of the 97 metropolitan departments, overseas territories as possible. Band 80 through 10 meters, and it's SSB. The Royal Belgian Amateur Radio Union is uh, organizing the UBA DX contest, CW, 1300 February 24th to 1300 February 25th. 80 through 10 meters, that one is CW only. There's the North American QSO party, RTTY, 1800 Zulu February 24th to 0559 Zulu February 25th. Organized by the National Contest Journal, the bands are 80 through 10 meters, and it's Radio Teletype, RTTY. Now, we've got a couple interesting ham radio operations that are going on. Um, two stations, ham operators from Greenland, and this doesn't seem to be a de-expedition. This is actually people, yeah. radio amateurs, who live and operate in Greenland. So kind of neat if you can either uh, tune in as a shortwave listener and hear these stations, or as you have, Jill, you've contacted one of these stations already. Yep, I contacted one, um, I think it's last Tuesday. So uh, we've got the two stations, uh, Oscar X-Ray 5, Alpha Kilo Tango. Yeah, that's the one. And that, uh, that's, that's the one that you yep. worked already? Yeah. Okay, very good. And the second one is uh, Oscar X-Ray 5, Delta Mike. Now, as we're recording here today on Friday, I noticed through one of the DX spotting sites that both of these stations are very active today. So it looks like they'll be around uh, just, uh, you know, working the different bands. So keep an eye out for them. And the other one is a D-Expedition that's running from February 10th through the 24th. And it is from a place called the Juan Fernandez Island, which is, I guess, somewhere off the coast of Chile. Yeah. Um, and it's using a very unique call sign, Charlie Bravo Zero Zulu Alpha. And they've been very active on a lot of different bands. So if you want to try to work that station or you want to try to tune them in, you have until the 24th of February. Charlie Bravo Zero Zulu Alpha. Um, an interesting call because the CB prefix had been reserved many, many years ago at the beginning of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Hmm. They actually got an agreement with the country of Chile to take the Charlie Bravo call prefix and use it for their broadcast stations. Hmm. So this is the first time I can remember a ham radio station using the Charlie Bravo prefix. So this could be a very unique one. So uh, check it out. So take those as a challenge, have some fun with them. Hopefully uh, you'll be able to uh, to hear them or uh, work them if you are a licensed ham radio operator. So we're out of time. We thank you for tuning in this week and we hope every week. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, International Radio Report. You can listen to our show on our YouTube channel, also International Radio Report. And uh, hey, what the heck, go check out our uh, Twitter account or X account as well, at IRRCKUT. Not a lot of followers there yet, but it is one way that you can get all of the links to the stories we talk about on the show each week. So uh, that will do it for us today. Have a great week. We'll talk to you again next Sunday on the International Radio Report on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal. Bye-bye. This is 
device of free China, Taipei, Taiwan.